Hello everyone, this is the Leicester Rheumatology Education Channel. I'm Kenny Sumbo, Exalt Rheumatologist at uh, Leicester. I'm also a honorary senior lecturer at the uh, Leicester Medical School. So this is a lecture on antibodies made easy, um, autonuclear antibodies in particular, just to help you understand what um, ANA studies, that's antinuclear antibodies, what they are and how um, to interpret them in the context of an autoimmune rheumatic disease, especially when this is suspected in a patient. So first of all, you have to get a very clear understanding of what autoantibodies are. So autoantibodies are proteins directed against um, components of cell surface. It can be directed against the components of the cytoplasm and also against nuclear components and mitochondria and nucleoli. Basically, cell, small structures within uh, the cells can have autoantibodies directed against them. Autoantibodies are abnormal in the sense that the actual organism has proteins that have been formed attacking the organism itself. And these have been implicated in causing disease when it comes to certain diseases, for example, lupus, systemic sclerosis, and other diseases in the rheumatological field. So as I mentioned earlier, these antibodies can be directed against cell nuclear components. Uh, there are examples of some of them, the um, antibodies against double-stranded DNA, which is found in people with lupus. Um, some of them are also referred to extractable nuclear antigens, ENA for short, where we have antibodies to anti-Smith, which is also found in lupus, or antibodies to ribonucleic um, particles, uh, which is anti-RNA antibodies that can be found in lupus as well, and other conditions such as systemic sclerosis. We have antibodies directed against cytoplasmic antigens. An example is the Rho antibody or La antibody. Rho antibody is also called SSA. Uh, La is also called SSB. And we have antibodies directed against ANCA, which is short for anti uh, neutrophilic uh, cytoplasmic antibodies, which are implicated in certain disease states such as vagueness, granulomatosis, or drug strauss, which are uh, now commonly called granulomatosis with polyangitis or asynophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. We also have antibodies directed against um, other structures within the uh, within larger cells itself, um, such as antiplatelets uh, antibodies or against red blood cells itself. Um, if, if patients have antibodies directed against platelets, these patients may have thrombocytopenia. We refer to that as an immune-related thrombocytopenia. Or you can have autoantibodies against serum components, um, such as rheumatoid factor antibody itself or antiphospholipid antibodies, which are implicated in um, antiphospholipid syndrome where patients have clotting disease. So um, immunofluorescence, indirect immunofluorescence is the method by which um, antinuclear antibodies, ANA, is run in the lab. We have two methods, general, uh, broad, broadly speaking. Um, some would argue that there are three where they use microassays, but broadly speaking, there are two methods that are commonly used. We have indirect immunofluorescence and the ELISA tests. So essentially what the immunofluorescence tests are, that what, what it is, is that um, um, you would get the patient's serum um, that containing the autoantibodies and essentially um, mix that with normal saline and wash up the saline and see how many immunofluorescence particles uh, are, are, are binded to the suspected antibodies that you've added in via the reagent. In the past, there used to be animal rodents that would do this, uh, but now we now use human cells because in the part, because animal cells, we're not animals, we're basically humans and basically uh, animal cells would not necessarily suffice. Now we have um, what's referred to as uh, human epithelial cells along human uh, two tumor cell lines, which are used commonly. In the past, rodent cells that were often used for this would generate uh, false negative results, uh, which led to the advent of what's referred to as ANA negative lupus. Now we know that most cases of lupus tend to be ANA positive and um, strongly positive uh, uh, as that, because lupus would be regarded as the stereotypical seropositive disease in, in actual sense. So the results of an ANA titer are reported as a titer, not a ratio. Although it's written as a mathematical ratio, it's actually a titer. What is a titer? A titer is actually the highest, highest dilution of serum at which the autoantibodies are still uh, detectable. So you keep diluting until the autoantibodies are no longer detectable. And the last reading whereby you could detect it before it became undetectable would be the, um, would be the titer uh, that you are reporting at. Um, again, to, for example, a titer can be recorded as 1 in 40, 
um, that would mean that you've had about 40 dilutions before you could get rid of the um, autoantibodies. That would mean that the titer strength for that patient serum is 1 in 40. Uh, generally, any titer less than 1 in 160 is regarded as normal. Um, in terms of normal figures, titers of 1 in 40 can be present in about 30% of individuals. Uh, when you double that titer to 1 in 80, that can be seen in about 13% 13 to 15, 15.15% of healthy individuals. If you double that still to a title of 1 in 160, that can be found in about 5% uh, of healthy individuals. And if you double that still to uh, 1 in 320, that can be found in 3% of healthy individuals. But generally, um, any title over one, uh, 1 in 160 will be regarded as positive. But the more the dilutions, the stronger the titer. So titers of 1 in 1600 are regarded as strongly positive whilst titers between 1 in 60, 1 in 160 and 1 in 1600 uh, would be regarded as moderately positive. That's the general way to look at it, the ballpark figure to really understand it. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the titer is derived by adding a bit of saline to the plasma, to the plasma of the uh, patient's blood. The plasma, as a reminder, is the liquid portion of blood containing all the autoantibodies in the cells. Um, um, separate from red blood cells and the rest of it. And it's just a question of diluting uh, severally. So the amount of dilutions gives you the actual titer strength after uh, the one. So one in 140 means that you've diluted 40 times before you could get rid of the autoantibodies. One in 80 means you've diluted 80 times to get rid of the autoantibodies. One in 320 means you've diluted 320 times to get rid of the autoantibodies. And that's the general way to actually look at when talking about ANA results, it is important to mention um, immunofluorescence patterns. Immunofluorescence patterns are commonly mentioned uh, in many labs, but they tend to be very, very nonspecific and they aren't usually indicative of disease. What that means is you can't really tie down one immunofluorescence pattern to any particular disease. The only exception is the uh, bottom pattern I've highlighted, which is the centromere pattern that is strongly associated with intersystemic sclerosis. So if a patient has an ANA result with a centromere pattern, I may then keep the patient under surveillance as that patient may then develop future uh, limited systemic sclerosis. But the other patterns are very nonspecific. So you can have various patterns ranging from peripheral or rim homogeneous speckled patterns related to various autoantibodies. But again, these are very nonspecific, as mentioned earlier, and I wouldn't necessarily um, pay a lot of attention to them, only if the titer strength is, is a large titer that is one in 160 and above. That would be when I would pay particular attention to the strength of titer being mentioned on the ANA result. So, so this cartoon shows you the various methods that can be used uh, for immunofluorescence, uh, generating ANA results within the lab. The indirect immunofluorescence on the left of your screen is what's commonly used in most labs, which involves the use of the human epithelial cells called the HEP2 cells. Uh, where you put the patient's serum within uh, the uh, reagent test tube and add the secondary antibody conjugated with fluorescence material, add a bit of saline and keep adding salines which constitute the amount of dilutions until you get rid of the um, binding um, to determine the actual strength of the ANA titer. ELISA, which is on the right, can be used in certain labs, but most labs tend to favor the indirect immunofluorescence because it's easier and relatively cheaper to use compared to the ELISA test itself. So this cartoon shows you what the various patterns look like. This is nucleoli where it picks off um, nucleoli within the cell nucleus. RIM is constituted around the rim of the nucleus. Um, so it's RIM is also called peripheral. Speckled creates lots of dots within the nucleus of the cell and homogeneous uh, presence as a homogeneous field within the nucleus of the cell. Uh, we'll show you further slides on that. Uh, nucleoli protein to mention are uh, uh, there are various of them, there are various, um, various types of them. We have Rho and La, which are related to Sjogren's disease, uh, a disease where you get dryness in the eyes, mouth, or dryness in, in most areas where there's um, most exocrine glands, uh, where there's dryness. Smith um, antibodies can be found in lupus. RNA antibodies can also be found in lupus. Jo1 antibodies can be found in conditions uh, where there's muscle disease, that's myositis. Uh, that is polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Uh, SLE uh, 70, also called topoisomerase, may be found in systemic sclerosis. Uh, Rho just, is just a repetition in itself. Leukulosum 
uh, antibodies to nucleosome uh, can be found um, in cases of systemic lupus erythematosus. So uh, bear that in mind with these antibodies and the antibody titers and patterns uh, that I've been mentioned. So um, speaking about patterns uh, themselves, this is what homogeneous looks like. You can see that the uh, nuclei of the cells are just common, uh, covered in a very defined pattern. Nothing stands out. This is just uh, a this this a homogeneous pattern. And like I said, immunofluorescence patterns are very non-specific, so uh, doesn't really suggest any disease. But you can see this sort of pattern in lupus or in other diseases like um, rheumatoid and the rest of it. So peripheral, you can clearly see how the antibodies line at the periphery or the rim of the cells. Again, the patterns are very non-specific, so you can't read too much into uh, those patterns that you see. But it is useful to note these patterns. Um, it's it's some it's more an academic exercise. Uh, nucleoli pattern, you can see that um, this is conjugated within the nucleus and picks off certain nucleoli. Nucleoli can often be confused with speckled. Uh, speckled the dots tend to be a lot smaller than nucleoli, uh, which you've noticed can be a bit chunky, uh, and that is the essential difference. So you can see speckled, you can see speckled, you can see that there's no clear definition of um, bits within the cells. So this tends to be uh, regarded as speckled uh, when you compare speckled and nu nu the nuclear pattern. But again, these patterns are non-specific and don't necessarily uh, suggest pointers to specific disease. Um, ANAs can, there are lots of false positives you can get with ANAs, but it is important that just because someone has a positive ANA result doesn't necessarily mean that that individual has disease. Um, having a positive ANA doesn't mean you have disease. You need symptoms of, uh, symptoms of connective tissue disease, either signs and symptoms to suggest that you have disease. Now, um, for students in Leicester, most of them would have been taught the glove and sweater approach. Um, I'll create other lecture series on this, so be on the lookout on this channel for the glove and sweater approach um, to uh, when you have a positive ANA, what you need to do. But it is important to mention that at least over 30% of people uh, regarded as normal will have a positive ANA, and these are healthy individuals. The older you get, you're more likely to have uh, a positive ANA, and there are certain other disease states that can generate uh, an ANA. I have a table on that, so um, just to mention that having a positive ANA doesn't necessarily mean you have disease. You always have to identify and take this in the right clinical context. So um, the patterns, although non-specific, can be inter interesting in that um, certain diseases, disease states can come to mind. Homogeneous as I said, can be found in lupus, can be found in drug-induced lupus. Speckled can be seen in some mixed connective tissue disease or Sjogren's peripheral. You can see that sometimes in lupus or systemic sclerosis. But the centromere pattern, which I mentioned uh, before, the centromere pattern is highly uh, related to the limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. So if you do see a centromere pattern, that tends to be the more specific of all the patterns that you see, hence the reason why patterns are still um, somewhat important. Um, again, as I mentioned, positive ANA doesn't necessarily mean you have disease. There are certain disease states that um, are, uh, a positive ANA can be found. Normal population uh, from previous slides, liver disease, certain infections, certain skin disease like psoriasis or lichen planus, even malignancy states like breast, prostate, uh, lymphomas and leukemias can have a positive ANA and, and majority of autoimmune diseases um, ranging, not necessarily rheumatic diseases, but um, type 1 diabetes, Addison's autoimmune thyroiditis or um, autoimmune anemias that can have ANA. ANA often is a pointer towards autoimmunity. The more, uh, if a patient has an autoimmune disease, they are likely to have a positive ANA. But again, having an ANA doesn't necessarily mean you have an autoimmune disease. You can inherit an ANA of parents that have an autoimmune disease. So do bear that in mind. So before we complete this lecture series, it is important to talk about when not to test for ANA. Do not check for ANAs when you're confirming the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. The diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is clinical, but you can do antibodies to rheumatoid factor or um, anti-cyclic citrullinated peptides to try and determine the prognosis or aggressive nature of the disease, but certainly do not do ANAs for this. Uh, do not do an ANA to evaluate fatigue, back pain, or any musculoskeletal pain that is unclear or undefined, especially in individuals that do not have features suggestive of connective tissue disease. Certainly do not do it for individuals that are asymptomatic. Uh, 
And ANAs, you generally do not need to repeat them if they've been done once uh, with low titer. They generally do not change uh, within uh, 12 months of testing. And if they are negative and you suspect that there's evolving disease, then certainly can be checked after a period of three to six months. Um, so thank you for uh, taking time to attend this lecture series. Uh, shout out to Anamika Dev uh, for the slide and slide concepts. Um, and watch out for other lecture series with, on this channel, Leicester Rheumatology Education. Please subscribe to the channel uh, and um, look out for other lecture series with this channel. Thank you.